The Ready, Set, Grow podcast is sponsored by Egg Expert, software designed for Canadian agriculture. Visit them today at eggexpert.ca. Welcome to the Ready, Set, Grow podcast, where we like to showcase startup and early stage companies, as well as visit with innovators in the agriculture and food industry. Today, we're here with Diana Laternis and special guest Art Freilich. Art, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here, Michael and Diana. Um, I I probably represent literally thousands and tens of thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands of, of people at, in my vintage who grew up in a, a farm in a small rural community and have followed their passion into agriculture and food, or many of us did. Uh, originally from East Central Saskatchewan, uh, we uh, grew up on a family farm there, livestock, grains, oil seeds. Uh, uh, it was your very typical family farm. Father was an immigrant from, from Germany. After the war, he was essentially a war orphan, and uh, he started the farm, and that's where we spent most of our life. Um, just fell in love with agriculture and farming, and it never left me to this very day. Uh, went off to the University of Saskatchewan and got a degree in agriculture, specializing in soil science which now is proving to be the most valuable discipline I could have ever imagined with all the interest in soil and soil health and regenerative agriculture and all those things. And uh, from there, I joined Farm Credit as a credit advisor. So, Diana, that's where I started my business career. Uh, It was a fantastic experience. I worked with some amazing people there, worked in one one or two-man offices. After I'd been there three months, they shipped me to a two-man office when I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? But it was fantastic. And I've had a number of uh, very interesting careers with great companies. Uh, left Farm Credit uh, to join a company called Herxt, uh, which is now Bayer, or part of Bayer. And then uh, after that, uh, I joined Alberta Wheat Cool as general manager and had a great experience there. And then I went off to business school in, in Wharton. Uh, late stage, uh, later stage in life, and and they put you through a rather large battery of tests when you get there to try to figure out who you are and what you want to do. And I was one of my thirty. I was one of thirty classmates, and and they said, you know, Art, you're the least likely senior executive person we've ever met in our lives. <laughs> you, you don't fit the profile at all. They said you are destined to work for yourself. You are destined to be a entrepreneur, and. Uh, Consequently, I came back and resigned from Alberta Pool and took over a, a struggling malting company and spent six years there. We were very fortunate. We turned that around. It became very successful for the Rar family and the whole family. And then after that, I just started investing in businesses. Uh, joined Ad Farm as their president and took a significant ownership there and, and have continually invested in, in uh, smaller startups, early stage companies. Uh, I'm not so sure I'm an entrepreneur. I think what I did was I set up an investment strategy to invest in entrepreneurs. <clears throat> so I don't can't take a lot of credit for starting companies. The only credit I get is I found some wonderful people who had a great idea, and I was able to get them a little bit of a hand up to get them started. And, uh, and the only other thing I would mention is is during all of those bouncing around in my career, I had the opportunity to work with some of the most amazing people you could ever imagine. I had phenomenal mentors. Uh, every every company I was with, I, I had terrific mentors. I got to travel the globe. Uh, I think I've been to 70 or 80 countries, of which 30 or 40 of my I've done business in of one kind or another. And all of those experiences uh, have uh, benefited me greatly as I move into this later stage in my life. So. Wow, that's an amazing career, Art. And I know uh, I know you do some humanitarian work as well. And so can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? I certainly would be happy to. I, I guess I, I, I go through very similar things as I think most young people do. When you start a career and you graduate and you get a job, you focus on moving up in your career, making money, and... Uh, and I've always been a bit of a contrary. I've been very lucky. The companies I worked for compensated me very well. Uh, I learned a lot. And then I guess when I got when I when I left work in my mid forties, um, I sat down and sort of did a reevaluation of what was important. And it, it and the first thing was you know, we have our, my business philosophy is very very simple. 
you've got to love what you do. I know I can't wait to get up in the morning. I'm at my office at six o'clock in the morning when I'm in town, which is more now because of COVID than it ever has been in my life. I used to travel 150 nights a year. Now I travel zero. So you got to love what you do. That's, that's the most important thing to me. Number two is you got to learn something new every day. Talk to someone that is, has a different opinion from what you do. Read books from the side of the aisle from where your where your politically leanings are. I'm very apolitical. I'm not involved in politics at all. I'll never have any intentions. So those are the two things. Learn something new every day. Love what you do. And the third one is you've got to make some money. You just That goes with it to, to allow you to do some of the things you want. But in my mid-40s, sort of added a fourth one to that that I hadn't really thought about. And I think it's a little bit older. And the fourth one now is leave a legacy. And, uh, and as, you know, I'm a little more mature now in my career. So the leaving a legacy part has become a bigger part of my business philosophy and our family's philosophy as well. So the legacy part of it. So we, we sponsor scholarships all over the world. Uh, in the developing world, we, we sponsor scholarship for, for young people to attend conferences in their area of study. Uh, interestingly, uh, most of them have been women, which, which and the other thing too is our focus is on women agriculture, and youth. Those are the three things that, that our family foundation and what we do focuses on. Uh, we have a gardening school that we support and are probably the single largest supporter of a gardening school in Peru, uh, involved in a demonstration farm in Ghana. We do scholarships at colleges and universities around the world. And uh, so that's a big part of what we do. And it's become a, and as each year goes by, it becomes a bigger and bigger part of, of where my mind is at, and where our family's mind is at, and the support that, that we want to give to these incredible young people and women around the world who have just been dealt a very, very bad deck you know, of cards. And they're wonderful people, and they're ambitious, and they're hardworking. And it just uh, is, is a great, great feeling. And you can actually see the results. So that's why the philanthropy part of our life now has become much bigger. Mm-hmm. How, how did you get started in that art? Like, what, what was the first thing <coughs> that happened? Like, how do you go to Peru and, and, and do these things? Like, how does that originate? You know, that's, that, that's a really interesting story. Uh, some of the other things we do is, is by design. You know, okay, you like doing scholarships. I was on the on the ABIC Foundation. I chaired the Board of Ag West Bio. We funded the ABIC conferences. And I always wanted to have young people be able to attend the ABIC conferences. So that was by design. It was I went to a good friend of mine who was the Minister of Agriculture in South Africa, or Deputy Minister of Agriculture in South Africa. And I said, Is there something we can do? And he said, Sure. So we sponsored for many years, we sponsored two young people to attend the ABIC conference, regardless of where it was in the world. And then I would go there and meet with them and stay in touch with them. And, and so somewhere by design, the Peru one is, is, is a different story. Um, I happen to be taking the ICD course, the Institute Corporate Directors course, the Rotman School of Business. And uh, I ran into a gentleman who was taking the ICD course to Haskins School of Business in Calgary. And we overlapped on one class. Just happened to be seated beside this fellow and, and we got talking and he was a small business owner as well. I was a small business owner, and we talked about life and what was going on in our businesses. And, and to make a long story short, you know, he, he said, you know, I, I, this, I started this initiative in Peru, building homes and schools and that sort of thing. And uh, I said, well, that sounds interesting to me, but I'm not interested in building homes and schools. I'm interested in nutrition and feeding. So I went down there, I don't know how many times, with him and on my own. Um, checking the environment, the soils in an area outside of Lima called Manchai, and finally made the decision, okay, this is something that we wanted to do. After much difficulty, we finally found a site to have our, have our, our gardening school, and it's been running for five or six years now, and we've graduated almost 400 women, primarily women. There's the odd man registered for it uh, in that period of time, and over half of those women have started gardening home gardens you got to remember, this is a very poor area. They, they live in shanties on the sides of hills, no water, no electricity. And so what we do is we support the gardening school. And, uh, and then the graduates 
what we do is we provide them with compost and pipe irrigation. And um, so they can use their gray water from their washing and their cooking. And, and, and it's been enormously successful so far. COVID has been a real challenge because our school had to get shut down. Excuse me, crew went into martial law, so they couldn't go to school. They couldn't even leave their homes. But I couldn't believe it. In December, the students all came back, and they took an, a garden. And you got to remember, this is just a pile of gravel. It's, it's, I think I've sent some pictures. And they came back, and they totally refurbished it, replanted it, and the gardening school was up and running uh, in January. And we'll probably have our first graduating class this coming year in later this summer or early fall. We do two graduations a year, and it's quite an experience. Uh, in many cases, the, the women are illiterate. They come from the Amazon during the Shiner. They were chased out by, during the, the uh, terrorist attacks there, and they just congregated around Lima for protection. And so they, many of them are illiterate. And the certificate they get when they graduate from their school is the first certificate they've ever gotten in their lives. And it's an incredibly emotional experience. And they're so keen to learn. And we're very strict. You know, you have a class every Saturday, and then you've got to take care of your garden plot. And uh, if you miss a class, you're out of the school. You know, we, we are very firm on that. And very rarely do we have a student who, uh, who doesn't, uh, who leaves the, the, uh, the program. So. So that's how it started. It was almost by happenstance. And, uh, some of the best things in life just happen that way. That's that's so admirable. Like it's just, no, just you know, really enriching cool. enriching those people's lives like that. And you know, the food itself, it's secure. You know, food security, right? As well. So um, good skills that they're teaching them, and and having good fresh food as well. Yeah, and and, and again, the home gardens. Uh, they can produce a little bit more than what their family needs, so they sell it to their neighbors or give it away. But now the next chapter in this is we have an agronomist down there that we've hired. He runs a greenhouse operation, very successful business person in his own right. And uh, our next plan is to have accumulate all the excess production from these home gardens and the gardening school. The gardening school produces a lot as well and uh, set up some... Uh, operation have it start a little cooperative where they can sell their excess product at the farmer's market. So that's sort of our next step. Now that got kind of put on the sidelines because of COVID, because we had to pivot very quickly when COVID came and we, we went from supporting the school to uh, continuing to pay our coaches because some of the top graduates, we've hired them on as our coaches and continue to pay our coaches. But also we provided food hampers because there was just literally nothing there. So we, Sometimes you have to pivot very, very quickly and do something very differently. So, but we're hopefully, we're not out of that yet by any means. We don't know if there's going to be a second wave or a third wave or a fifth wave, but we'll just pivot as we need to to make sure that our students and their families are taken care of as best as we can. Oh, that's, that's excellent art. Um, you mentioned you had mentors throughout your career. And I know that there's probably a lot of early stage companies or young entrepreneurs, you know, will listen to the podcast. And so can you give us some insights into how you picked a mentor or how you got matched up with one? Or, you know, what are some of the tips that, um, you know, for, for finding a good mentor? Well, that's a really good question. And I'm not so sure I have a really good answer. Most of my mentors were my bosses. You know, I had phenomenal, you know, Bob Ford with Foreign Credit. He was a district supervisor when I was a young credit advisor who knew absolutely nothing. And Bob really helped me so much uh, during those, those early stages of my career. Uh, just simple business practices. And, and, and But I've had wonderful mentors. Uh, uh, Morris Delage, my, my boss at, at Hearst, uh, was a phenomenal mentor. Uh, he knew exactly how, how much rope to give me and how quickly to pull the rope in when I got in trouble. But he was phenomenal. And he had great advice and very stage advice. Uh, Guido Rar, who owned Rar Malting Company, and J.F. Hole, who was the other one at Rar Malting Company, were phenomenal mentors to me. Uh, and uh, so most of my mentors were my bosses. Uh, but I had other mentors as well from, from outside of uh, companies I worked for. And how do you pick them? Um, Again, I'm not so sure I, I can tell you exactly how I picked them. 
but you know, uh, there's there's some that I've worked with uh, uh, sort of as advisors that have I've become very close to and have supported me. You know, people like Lance Secretan, who is a, a phenomenal business coach, consultant, advisor. And, you know, got me. I still continue to read his books after all these years and think about some of the things he taught us. Uh, Gary Dewar, my CEO at Alberta Wheat Pool, uh, was a phenomenal mentor for me. I, he toughened me up a lot. You know, I I was probably a little soft in, in my in making tough decisions. But you know, some of the best advice I got is if you don't make a decision, you are making a decision to do that. Just remember that. That was one of the, the sayings. Of, and the other one is network and contacts are only important to those people who don't have them. If you've got a network and you've got contacts, you don't think about it because you don't have to because they're already there. <clears throat> so don't ever forget that it, if you don't make a decision, it's because you are, you are making a decision not to do anything. So don't be under any illusion that I'm not making a decision, so I'm okay. And the second thing is build up your network and build up your contacts and stay in touch with them and continue to exchange ideas and advice. Some of the best mentors I've got, and I do not know if I call them mentors, were my classmates at work. I still stay in touch with many of them today. They're from all over the world. I was the only Canadian in the class. And we're always exchanging ideas. What's going on in your country? What's going on in your market, your business? I was the only agricultural person, so, but it's not about agriculture. It's about business practices and where's the, where's the world going? Where are the markets going? What's, what's the newest technology that's coming out? So uh, spend some time thinking about that and, uh, and, and just ask. If you, if, you, if you want someone to give you some of their advice, you remember it's free, so in many cases that's exactly what it's worth. But just ask the question. You, very rarely will you be turned down. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I get to mentor a lot of young uh, business people and entrepreneurs now. Uh, love it. They bring... I get more out of it than they do. There's no question about it. They're enthusiastic. They're full of great ideas. They like to dream. And so I, I enjoy working with young business people and entrepreneurs. I mentor a lot of women. Uh, one of the big things is, is I'm committed to get more women on boards. And we've been fortunate. Three or four of the women I've mentored in the last four or five years are now safely seated on a board of directors. And, and uh, in, uh, in various organizations, which has been incredibly rewarding to see that happen. And <clears throat> so just ask, you'd be surprised. Uh, most people will say, you bet, what, what can I do? And I find women are the least likely to ask, which is kind of surprising, but for good reason, I'm sure. I don't know what those reasons are. Yeah, yeah some sometimes it's time and sometimes it just might be, you know, like, why you know and so um i think that people don't um or maybe they underestimate the power of a mentor um you know and, and think they can go it alone and that's where you know mentors like just even contacts that i have and talk to i learn so much um you know just having those conversations and that's why you know originally uh you know joe and i started this podcast is because we wanted to talk to people um, because during COVID we weren't getting out as much. So, you know, it, it's like you know, having these conversations with you or, or, you know, all the others that we've had conversations with, we learn something every time. And so it's just, uh, it's just a pleasure to have you here, Art, and to hear all the, all the things that you've done in your life so far, like, wow, what a, what a full life and, and just helping others, like the enrichment that you provided and, you know, humanitarian efforts and leaving a legacy, like there's so much there. Um, in terms of leadership, is there is there some things there that you see that you can share that, you know, when, from a leadership standpoint, because you've been on boards and you've been in high positions in companies, you know, what, what things can you impart on others in terms of leadership? Well, again, again in my stage of my career, I sit on a number of boards. I probably get a request at least every two months to join a board. I, I have not accepted any of those requests for years now. I sit on the boards of directors of some absolutely amazing companies. They tend to be family owned or very private, tightly held privately or companies that I have a significant investment in. You know, companies like Richardson, the Richardson family, the Hokanson family, the Ryerson family, uh, you know, which are all tightly held family 
control companies, uh, and, uh, and and also uh, other other businesses that I am a significant investor in, run in terrific leadership that has managed. The, the one thing I've, I've experienced is, is when I look at, at leadership skills, and I'm not so so sure I was ever a great leader. Um, you know, I, I'd be the first to admit that perhaps I wasn't as good a leader as I could have been or should have been. But I watch people in the organizations I am involved in now, and I watch how they handle their people. Um, you know, I had a wonderful experience many, many years ago with, with a very senior executive with uh, one of the companies I was working for, and I was very low down in the organization. My job was to organize tours, you know, meetings, and uh, the senior executive from overseas came over and and. Uh, I was arranging for a helicopter to take them on a tour of some place. I didn't remember where it was. And uh, there, there wasn't enough room on the helicopter for me, and I wasn't expected to go with the rest of them. And the senior executive from overseas turned out, they said, aren't you coming? I said, oh, there's, there's, there's a weight restriction I can't join. He said, hold the fort. So he got off the helicopter. He said, you and I are going to spend the day together. And one of the most incredible experiences of my life and how he treated his people throughout the organization. Don't ever forget how important everybody is in the organization. And, you know, I've often said the most important person in a company is the receptionist. That's the first impression you, you often get when you're somebody new that's phoning in or contacting. So don't ever forget, you know, just take care of your people. Now, you will have some people that just won't necessarily fit in. You will have to make some very difficult decisions. You will have to coach people out. You will have to downsize on occasions. I've had to do that more times than I care to. But just remember, it's the people in the organization. We always talk about how important customers are, and they are important. We always talk about how important the market is, and it is important. But really, in most organizations, it's the people that are there that are going to make or break the company. And I think quite often with young entrepreneurs and startup companies, uh, there's a fair bit of ego involved. You know, it's my idea and my company and I started this. But you know what? If you're going to be successful, you better surround yourself with people a whole hell of a lot smarter than you are because that's how you will be successful. So part the ego to the side. Just learn as much as you can. We already know you love what you're doing. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Do the second step. Talk to different people. Learn something new every day. Talk to people who you don't necessarily agree with from the other side of the political aisle, from the other side of, of where your philosophy stand. You will be a much, much better person. And then number three will kick in. You'll make money. And money is the third one. Do the first two right. Love what you do. Learn something different every, every, every day. Talk to different people every day. And number three will, will, uh, will come along. And then eventually in your life, I expect all of you, when you're successful, to start giving back. It doesn't have to be money. Devote time. You know, when, when, when I grew up on the farm, there were two things that were incredibly important in our life, other than our family and our church, was curling and 4-H. You know, that was, that was our exit on the farm. And uh, we all became passionate 4-H members, and my parents were all 4-H leaders. Met my wife through 4-H. Uh, and uh, and we all curled. We all became competitive curlers. And uh, and I look back on those days, and that was the foundation for you know everything that because 4-H was a great, great community, great leaders. You know, it, it just it was a foundation. Sometimes I think maybe we don't have that foundation like we used to. But I'm being a bit nostalgic about that right now, and I'm sure it, it's fine. It, it, good things are happening now, and. and Many with different ways than with the upbringing that we had, and I guess say literally tens of thousands of other farm kids across Canada who grew up in that same environment. Yeah, that's some uh, great advice, Art. Um, are there any trends that you're watching in the agriculture and food industry right now? Uh, yeah, absolutely, there is. Uh, certainly, from you know, we're we're relatively small investors. We're angel investors, and the trends we're watching now. The first trend we, we, we I have a real passion for the brewing and distilling and malting industries. So we followed that trend and we've had some very successful investments in the distilling and brewing industry, craft brewing industry, which are turning out to be very, very good. Unfortunately, I think many of the craft brewers out there are going to find it's much more difficult than they anticipated. 
so that was one trend that we got on the front end of it and uh, have done quite well. Other trends that we're watching right now that we're starting to fall, follow very carefully, this whole plant-based protein food sector, I think is, is, a, is, is a definite trend. Now, sometimes uh, uh, we forget that we're already in the plant-based food business, canola oil, malt for beer, the beverage industry. So it's not like we're reinventing it. We're just taking it the next step, step. And it is going to threaten, I think, probably the meat industry to a certain extent, because that's where everybody seems to be talking about. But, but so that's, you know, we've made some investments in those areas now, uh, albeit they're startup and they're small and they're early stage. And they may not make it, but that's, that's the risk of being an angel investor, early stage investor. Uh, the other area that we're, we're looking at very, very carefully now is this whole area of biologicals. And, and, you know, as I said earlier, studied soil science in university. That was my major. <coughs> I never really practiced it at all. And all of a sudden now it's the in thing, you know, the soil, the soil, the soil, the soil for good, good reason. So I think. We are going to see a shift to, to the use of more biologicals in agriculture, or that could be for plant nutrition, um, enhanced root development, water and nutrient use efficiency, perhaps even uh, plant health, pesticide control uh, products or, or pest control products. So, and I think we're still at a very early stage in that, but there's some incredibly promising uh, uh, initiative and ideas and technologies out there. Now, there are biologicals. Our regulatory people don't really understand how to how to manage these things and how to, how to register them. They're used to registering chemistry, which and biologicals are a little less uh, predictable in terms of what the results are. But I think there is some uh, there is some there's something there. So we've started to put some interest and money and resources and mentorship and support to companies that have come up with. Uh, with uh, some new technologies there. So those are three, the malting and distilling and craft brewing industry, um, the whole plant-based protein, plant-based food, I shouldn't just say protein, plant-based food. The diets are gonna change, there's no question about that. And the next one is biological, and there's a few other ones as well. Uh, I'm not an IT person, uh, but I know there's tons of technologies there, autonomous sensors and drones, I've got some interest and some investments in some of those areas, but I don't really have a passion for that. It's not where my heart is. My heart is more uh, in the producing of food as opposed to monitoring this stuff through satellites and that sort of thing. So, so, and again, it's where your passion is. That's where, you're, you're, where you should go. And, and something you understand as well. I don't really understand IT. Uh, I know how to turn my computer on and I know how to turn it off. God forbid it ever goes, something goes wrong with it. I, a direct line to my IT support person, Katie, and she has to come sort me out more times in a week than you can imagine. So. Yeah, uh, thanks for sharing that. There's a lot of great things going on in sort of the agriculture industry right now. Um, I also have a question. So we get to work with a lot of small businesses and they're looking to set up like a board of directors or looking for advisors. Um, do you have any tips uh, for these uh, companies? Uh, Yes, uh, absolutely. If you're going to set up a board of directors, uh, that's a very different board of, board, of, board of advisors or board of directors. If you're going to set up a board of directors, you've got to remember there's a huge legal liability and responsibility for a board member. So are you, first of all, as a, as a founder or a startup, there's no doubt the benefit of having an outside board member is, or members is, is really critical. But you got to remember, they're going to have to take on a fair bit of liability, legal liability. I always say to someone who wants to join a board, I said, how attached are you to your house? Because if something goes wrong here, uh, they will they will break through that veil and they will come right after you. They'll find who has the deepest pockets in an organization, board member or management, and that's who they're going to go after. So, uh, so make sure that if you're going to approach someone to be a board member, have those things thought out. Have you got directors and officers insurance? Do you know what it is you're asking for? If they're a good potential board member, they've already thought about this themselves. They're going to have they're going to ask all these questions as well. So I'm always a little leery, and I, I rarely join a board in a startup company for those very reasons. 
I am more than happy to be an advisor to a startup company because you don't have that legal liability. You can still perform a lot of the same functions that a, a board member, there's a board member does, but not have the same corporate legal financial liabilities and responsibilities. And so I, I do sit as an advisor to many organizations uh, and uh, try to bring a little bit, a few nuggets of ideas to them. So to sort out exactly what it is you want, uh, at some point in time, you will want a board of directors. They bring enormous value to an organization, especially if you're early stage. You know, bring people who have a strong financial background. We all know that most entrepreneurs and startups, they love what they do. They have a great idea. They're technically very sound. But they don't tend to be very financially literate. One of the best things I ever did in my life was joining Farm Credit as a credit advisor. At an early stage of my career, I learned about financial statements. I learned how to, how to read a balance sheet. And I've never lost that. My recommendation is, as soon as you graduate from years, you get a job for two years with a financial institution. So you learn, you know, the coffee pot's always on when you make a loan. It's never on when you go to collect it. So you, you learn people as well, you know, how to evaluate people. And uh, so, but again, the value of a board member or an advisory board member is enormous. Just make sure you know what you want. And, uh, and you know, and the other good thing about being an advisor to the board, you know, is you don't have to compensate those people. They do it for nothing in most cases. A board member will probably want some form of, of compensation, which is fine. At some point in the life of your company, you have to be prepared to do that. Early stage companies may not have the financial resources to, to do that. And there are so many great people out there who would make great advisors and great board members. Just ask. Thank you, Art, uh, for sharing that information. Uh, before we head out, is there anything else you'd want our listeners to know about? Well, not really. I've enjoyed this. I, 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 you know, it's interesting when, when Joe first approached me to do this, I, I think I kind of sent him an email back saying, you know, you know I, I, I don't think I have anything to say. I probably said way more than I had to say already. But I, I used to speak all over the world. I think I've probably given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of speeches at conferences. And about 10 years ago, I just said, you know what? This is too stressful. I don't enjoy it. So I quit doing it. Uh, and I think this is the second public appearance I've made. And I suspect this will be public unless you edit me out, which I wouldn't be disappointed at all if you did. <coughs> In probably the last seven or eight years. I just don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think the only in-person one I've done was when I, when Fred and Deanna asked me to go into Farm Credit to talk about what we just talked about. And uh, that was enormously stressful. And I said, I'll never do that again. But uh, so I just, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. You've got me out of my comfort zone, which is always a good thing. And uh, the only thing I would say is just remember, love what you do. Learn something new every day. Talk to somebody different from every day if they're different opinion. Make a little bit of money. And then when the time is right, start leaving a legacy. Whatever that is, just make the world a little better place uh, if you can. If our listeners have any other questions for you, uh, is there any way that they can get in contact with you? Absolutely. Uh, my email is art at agriview, A-G-R-I-V-I-E-W dot net. And I just wanted to thank our listeners uh, for tuning into the Ready, Set, Grow podcast. And I wanted to thank you again, Art, for joining us uh, to chat about uh, all of these sort of great topics. And uh, it gives us uh, a lot of things to think about. And uh, hopefully we can chat again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Enjoy. I, surprisingly, I enjoyed this very, very much. Okay. Take care. <laughs>